Okay, I guess we are already, uh, we are already on. So please, I give the word to Yoshi to introduce our next speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Carolina. So ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure and honor of introducing our plenary speaker, Shafi Goldwasser. <clears throat> Shafi Goldwasser is the C. Lester Hogan Professor in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Berkeley and the Director of the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing since 2018, where she follows its founding director, Richard Karp. Uh, professor Goldwasser moved to Berkeley from the MIT, where she was the RSA Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, professor Goldwasser is also a professor of computer science and applied mathematics at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Uh, she studied applied mathematics in, at Carnegie Mellon University and received her PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley in 1984. Professor Goldwasser was the recipient of the ACM Turing Award in 2012, together with her collaborator Silvio Micali for their pioneering work in the field of provable security, which laid the mathematical foundations that made modern cryptography possible. Their work turned crypt cryptography from an art into a science. Professor Goldwasser was the recipient of the Girdle Prize in 1993 and 2001. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the Israeli Academy, of Science and the Russian Academy of Science. Professor Goldwasser was an invited lecturer at the ICM in 1990 uh, in Kyoto and was a plenary speaker in 2000, 2002 in Beijing. So today she will speak about secure machine learning. So Shafi, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, th thank you for the invitation. I wish I could be there actually. It would be um, interesting to be in Brazil, but hopefully sometime in the future and maybe not too far off. So I will speak about safe machine learning and um, a more uh, in particular on privacy, verification and robustness in the presence of adversaries in the domain of machine learning. So as was mentioned, I am actually in training um, a cryptographer or, and a theoretical computer scientist. But today I'm going to talk mostly on issues that come up in machine learning. And I just want to say that um, Cryptography, very basic research in cryptography, has had uh, consequences, which uh, I've talked about before in these mathematical forms on uh, electronic commerce, on cryptocurrencies, on cloud computing, even on um, in, in, in quantum computing, in some sense, in encouraging people to look at problems like factorization and so forth, where in a quantum computers you could factor and break cryptography, um, whereas on a classical computers, we don't know how to do so. So all of this to motivate the fact that today, I'm actually going to talk about machine learning from a cryptographer's point of view and hope to show you how some methods from cryptography can address some issues that come up in machine learning today. Um, so when I say machine learning, it's a very you know, wide, the many models, many definitions. So I really am going to stick to a very a specific definition, but more generally, uh, as we start, you know, machine learning is really in the intersection of statistics, artificial intelligence, theoretical computer science. And the one thing to remember that is relevant to my talk is that machine learning algorithms learn from and make predictions on data, and they're not explicitly programmed, or rather they learn from the data and then you they run on, um, on data. And the idea is that you first have, you have two phases, if you know nothing, you just have to know that about machine learning. So you have a phase of training where you get a lot of sample inputs and then you build some sort of hypothesis, an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm. And after the training phase, you might have a prediction phase or uh, a, a phase where you use this model hypothesis that was built during the training phase. And um, the machine learning algorithms that we are using today, most of them, you know, you could think of it could be even linear regression, logistic regression, a decision tree, or neural nets, which are all the hype. Uh, all of these models, more or less, have been around for a long time. The reason that we are paying tremendous amount of attention to them now, and they seem to be changing the par algorithmic paradigm, is because once there's a lot of data, as we have today, it seems to change the accuracy of these algorithms and what we can do with them remarkably. And so much so that probably five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to give this talk. Um, 
I mean, definitely, I won't. I wouldn't have been able to give this talk, but I think that's true by and large. That the what we hear about in terms of machine learning algorithm is something from the last four or five years, and they have uh, made a, a real impact in the, in the in health, sort of in trying to understand um, health predictions, you know, uh, disease trends, medications, in finance, predicting financial markets in consumer uh, targeting. We all know that when we use any kind of uh, Google or phone or Facebook uh, in infrastructure, uh, understanding traffic patterns, energy usage in facial in image recognition, speech recognition, and in the more mundane things, uh, essentially threat prediction models for security. And the last three things on my list here are things which I, I bold faced, policing, bail and credit rating. And these are sort of most relevant to the, my talk, that these days uh, people, in, at least in the US, they're using machine learning algorithms to decide where, where to send police cars. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about whether to use machine learning to decide who should go out on bail, free on bail, and who should stay in jail, or in credit rating. That is, you have a description of a customer, and then you decide whether to give them a loan or not based on an algorithmic prediction. So these are all um, start as a research project, but these days, for example, in terms of bail, there are actually states where you, they're using algorithms in helping to decide whether to set people on bail, free on bail or not. And similarly for, I think this is in, um, in uh, New Orleans, a, and in Pittsburgh, they're utilizing algorithms to decide where, the, where to send police cars, where is there more likely crime uh, happening so you could send your police car to effectively use your resources. Now, all of this means that there is a basic shift of power, whereas before these decisions were made by um, bodies, maybe people, maybe committees, um, maybe a bank clerk in the case of credit rating or a judge in the case of bail. Um, now it's made, it's being decided by computer programs or at least being advised by computer programs. And this shift of power requires attention. Uh, so we may love this as mathematicians or as computer scientists who've designed the algorithm. And we say it's so efficient and it's so accurate and it's much better than relying on fallible humans, but uh, we don't call all the shots. So for example, uh, in California, this last election, there was a proposition called Proposition 25, which was to replace cash bail with risk assessment tool. Risk assessment is essentially a machine learning algorithm so there was a referendum that was supposed to decide whether uh, to accept this, uh, uh, what was passed by the legislator a few years earlier in 2018. And what the legislator proposed was the following bill. He said, first of all, we're gonna end cash bail. So cash bail means that somebody is a suspect and then uh, they decide whether, if it's someone who's wealthy, it's a lot of money for somebody who's poor, it's less money. And if they pay that money, then they can go out on bail. So the, that is clearly unfair to people who don't have money. Uh, and uh, this is very class related. So the proposition was we're gonna end cash bail, which is clearly unfair, but there was another part of the proposition. And that was, we're gonna replace cash bail with a machine learning algorithm based on statistical evidence to determine if a suspect should be released or detained. And what, is, what was the statistical evidence? I assume the idea was that you'll have uh, access to past data where you would have features of where the suspect is, meaning what the crime is, what the age is, maybe um, what the history um, of this person is, uh, and then whether they were released on bail, and if so, whether they committed a crime while, while they were on bail, whether they showed up for trial, and use all this body of data to determine a model that will be a good predictor whether in the future when you get a particular suspect uh, feature vector, which is what we call his characteristics, to let him out in bail or not. So this proposition was up for election, for vote, and it did not pass. Now, why did it not pass? So the debate essentially, which is just over from the internet, was that the supporters said, obviously, the cash bail is classist, racist. Of course, we should do away with it. However, the opponents were to of two types. One were, of course, the bond uh, industry, which were going to lose a lot of money if they canceled the cash uh, bail. 
But the more interesting ones were the civil rights advocates who said that cash bail, yes, is fundamentally flawed. But while algorithms or programs or machine learning algorithms can pitch you a song or sell you a toaster, they should not be used for release decisions. The factors considered for release will still pe lead people of color. So I'm just reading uh, from what I have here on the right, uh, being held for trial at disproportionate rates. Proposition 25 is further from the existing problem, but no closer to the solution. So this decision not to accept this proposition, which obviously everybody felt was the right thing to do, is very indicative of what's going on in the world now. So if you debate, if you listen to the debates that are around in, in the US, in movies, in, in documentaries, in law departments, the discussion is again and again about we should not let algorithms replace existing systems because somehow we don't trust them. We don't think they take in societal values into account. Uh, and you know what? The devil that we know is better than the devil we don't know. Okay, but this is a, a mathematics talk. We're not talking about uh, social agendas. So from a, as a computer scientist or as a mathematician, there actually is a, you know, a lot of things to address, even in very concrete terms without going to this sort of general distrust of algorithms. So here are three things that as a computer scientist, I would think we need to answer before we could feel more comfortable in using an algorithm to replace current decision-making processes. So first of all, and those are the things that I wanna talk about in this talk. So during the development, or it's called the training phase of the machine learning algorithm, ML stands here for machine learning, the question that we should answer is what past data does the algorithm designer have access to? So what is actually this data that he has access to? Is this data in itself uh, gonna be kept private, private during the training of the algorithm? Is it uh, a biased data or is it good data? And you know, of course you have to determine what bias means, but what is the past data? That's the first thing one should determine. Then you can talk about the quality of the data and whether you're gonna access it completely or in privacy. So this is during the development. Second thing, suppose someone developed, and in fact, in the California case, they were gonna give a lot of money to companies who were developing and then almost equally the same amount of money for companies who were gonna scrutinize the algorithms developed. So post-development, how do you actually verify? How do you scrutinize the machine learning algorithm? How do you know that they did a good job? I mean, just fitting the data perfectly, for example, even 100% doesn't mean they did a good job about on the future or that they got the essence out of the examples they saw in order to be able to predict accurately whether they should release someone bail in the future. So do you verif when you verify the machine learning algorithm, do you again have access to all historical data to check against? Do you get to have open source access to the machine learning algorithm that was developed? And actually, maybe the most interesting mathematical question is in what formal sense can you verify a data-driven algorithm is correct? So the algorithm, it's not that there is a, um, you know, essentially a mathematical formula that you have to show that the program you developed fits the mathematical formula. It was derived from data. So how do you d formally define uh, a, that the algorithm was derived successfully? Okay, the third thing is, okay, let's say that you've uh, designed the machine learning algorithm, you've verified it in some formal sense yet to be defined, okay? And now you're starting to use it. And let's stick to the bail example. You're starting to use it in the future, but the future distributions are not necessarily the past distribution. So you may have learned a wonderful algorithm with respect to past suspect criminals, but the future suspect criminals are very different. So does your algorithm generalize to unseen distributions you know, for future uh, use? Uh, is it robust against adversarial distributions? In other words, if someone tweaks their data in such a way to avoid being judged correctly. And finally, there's a notion of cold fairness uh, which is, has become a big deal in computer science now in the machine learning community, which is what if your data contain too little information on some minority distribution? So maybe the data is wonderful. Usually the example is on white men, but maybe if it's um, African-American women, there's such a small amount of them in the data. How do you know that your algorithm is gonna perform well on it? So there's sort of three challenges here. And that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, in my talk. There's many more challenges, but that's what I'm gonna talk about verifiability, 
of machine learning models, robustness, what can we do when the future distribution deviate from the training distribution? So this is how we're gonna use it in the future and this is what we were trained on. And in fact, what if it deviates in an adversarial manner? And finally, privacy. So what about privacy while you are training your machine learning algorithm? And this I am going to talk about last because there's been the most attention paid to it. So I think it's gonna be more interesting to talk about these two, but just a word in case we don't get to it, since I know I only have 50 minutes. Um, and that is that there has been a lot of work on privacy. Sort of how do you actually train machine learning even though you can't look at the data completely? And um, uh, very ingenious ideas. They use a lot of cryptography, but uh, mostly they result in prototypes. So you can, ha uh, you can do it in the lab in some sense. But the whole point about the machine learning is do you use large scale data? And the question is whether what we know really uh, scales up. So you need new methods in order to scale up that is to address privacy during training machine learning algorithm. And again, machine learning algorithm can be linear regression, could be logistic regression, very simple models. But still the question is, can you do it without actually looking at the data in the clear and come up you know, with a prediction uh, algorithm uh, when you have a lot of data at, uh, in front of you. Okay, so my, if you, if you, even if you've uh, stopped paying attention from here on, the issue is how do we verify machine learning algorithms? How do we make sure they're robust? And how do we keep privacy of the training data? Uh, by the way, you can interrupt me anytime if somebody has a question. And it's a result of several papers um, and uh, I will mention those papers when we get to it. So the papers are on verification, on robustness, these two, and the last one is on privacy. And I'll mention my co-authors when the resu relative result comes out. So let's just start with some definition, okay? It's mathematics, we want some definition of learning. And we'll take a definition that's due to Les Valiant from 1984. I think it's the most accepted definition in the theoretical community, at least. So there's a lot of words on the slide and I'll just talk through it. So there's no really point in reading it. So the general idea in this definition is this, you're given labeled examples. That's not always the case in machine learning. Sometimes it's not labeled, but in the setting of this talk, that's what I'll do. So X here is like a vector of features. Again, it could be age, uh, salary, uh, income level, history of crimes and so forth. And then you've got, oh, this C should be an F. You have a label F. There's some function that labels X either with zero or one. So you can think of this as release or hold in terms of bail or give a loan or don't give a loan and so forth, or send a police car, don't send a police car and so forth. And X is drawn according to some unknown distribution possibly, okay, a, which we'll call distribution a, P. And we say that a pack learning, so this is what Valiant called it probabilistically an approximately correct learning algorithm, essentially what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to look at this data to sam get samples that look like X and label f of x and generate after a while after looking and processing it come up with an hypothesis an hypothesis is just a program and the hypothesis usually comes in a class of programs so it could be if we're talking about logistic regression it's a logistic formula if we're talking about a decision tree it looks like a decision tree if we're talking about neural net it looks like a neural net okay and the requirement is that this hypothesis is a good one what does it mean good one it means that if you look at the loss of this hypothesis with respect to the truth so F is the real label. Should you release, should you not release? H is what your hypothesis says. And we say that with respect to distribution that we've seen, the loss is not too big. So we want the loss to be small. So this is a parameterized definition, less than epsilon with high probability. And there's some reason why you have both epsilon and delta uh, that has to do with uh, whether you by chance got bad data, but in any case, all right? So pack learning just means I get exa labeled examples. I come up with an hypothesis and I want the hypothesis will match the ground truth, which I don't know, but it exists, okay, um, with good probability, okay, namely small loss uh, with high probability. Okay, so our first question was, how do we, hmm, why don't I, hold on, how do I, oh, okay, how do I verify it? So from, you know, 
for my uh, past work, there's a lot of verification tools for algorithms. We have program verification, something called interactive proofs, zero knowledge interactive proofs, multi prover interactive proofs. However, all of these things essentially have the following premise. You have some program and you'd like to check that this program actually is equal to some function f. So the program you don't know, if, there's an f which describes what your, your goal is and you wanna check that your program on input x is equal to f of x. And interactive proofs, for example, would, would, would be a, scale, a schema for proving that this program on x is equal to f of x and so forth. The thing is that in all of these examples, f is pre-specified. Whereas in a machine learning setting, f is this unknown ground truth. So I don't have a, an f that's specified then that, that I'm trying to prove that my program is equal to. In fact, I'm not even supposed to know, I don't even know if f can be captured in the hypothesis class. Maybe this f cannot be written, described as a decision tree or a logistic formula or a neural net, okay? So what are we supposed to verify exactly? So the first thing we need is a definition. So uh, here's how we're gonna define it. Or in this work with uh, Sh uh, Jonathan Schaefer, a student at Berkeley, Guy Rothblum from uh, Weizmann and Emilio Dio from uh, Technion. So the idea is the following. We're gonna have two parties. We're gonna think of, I'm gonna anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize, I'm just gonna talk, talk about it in terms of people, but these are algorithms. So there's on one side, uh, there's an algorithm which is the learner, the learning algorithm, the machine learning algorithm, and it's gonna have a double act. It's gonna learn and then it's gonna prove. And on the right side, there's a verifier algorithm. And I want there, the, 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 somebody's gonna design some kind of hypothesis by having access to a distribution, as we said before, examples X and labels F of X. And they're gonna maybe take a long time to do it. And eventually they're gonna say, I have a good hypothesis. And they're gonna send it over to the verifier. And now the verifier is gonna want a proof. So they're gonna go questions. It's gonna be an interactive proof. So you can ask questions, get answers, questions, answers, questions, answers. And at the end he says, I accept your hypothesis or I reject it. Now, so what's the difference between the verifier and the prover? I mean, why does the verifier even need the prover? He can redo the whole thing himself. Because we're gonna say, look, there's no point in them being the same. Uh, then there's no need for two of them. What we'd like is that the verifier's job is gonna be easier than the prover's job. So it might take a tremendous amount of time to learn, looking at the entire distribution, the entire past data. But we want the verification job to be easier. And that might mean that the access to the data of the verifier, he has less data to look at. Maybe he doesn't look at all everything, but he has some random sampling in here. And maybe it's even a qualitative difference. So in other words, instead of just getting, maybe the learner here can do experiments. He can give an X and say to the judges of the past or the current judges, here's an X, here's a, a, a suspect. What would you say? Accept, uh, send on bail or keep in prison. So we can run experiments. So that's usually called membership queries. Gives an X and asks, is it a yes or a no? Whereas the verifier, he can't do that. He can just maybe have, get random samples from listed pair, pairs and depending on that should verify whether the hypothesis is a good one or not, okay? So this is the framework, they're two parties. They both have access to the data distribution but their access might be a little different. And now we need a definition. So in the same way that we had pack learning, now we'll have pack verification. Okay, so what's pack verification? So we say that a class of hypothesis, again, a decision trees or whatever, is pack verifiable if the following is true. That there exists a verifier and prover, okay? such that the, here is uh, what we would like to be true. We will define a lot, we, we'll look at a loss function L, which takes the, the H, the hypothesis to the prover output, and says, what is the probability that this H agrees uh, with the distribution? So in other words, on X, it gives the right prediction. So this is actually probability of loss. Okay, so how much does the hypothesis lose with respect to uh, the distribution? in terms of um, prediction. And then I was gonna say there's sort of the optim uh, optimal loss. So among all hypotheses in this class of hypotheses, which H prime loses the least, okay? So we look at all possible hypotheses and we say, this is the least that you can lose, this is opt. And what I'd like it to be it, between this prover and verify, I want two properties. First of all, that it's possible to prove when the hypothesis is in fact a good one. And I call that completeness. 
So there exists some prover algorithm that after interacting with the verifier, the prob verifier will say, I accept the hypothesis. What we want is that this will happen when the loss is small. So for the hypothesis, so this is a little h, for the hypothesis that you received from the prover, the loss is close to optimal. And maybe the more interesting requirement is soundness. I want to say, regardless of what the prover does, what I, the prover might be the, uh, trying to convince you to accept an hypothesis, which is not a great hypothesis. You're going to say, I'm not going to accept it if the hypothesis that I got from this prover is far away from optimal and close and far by epsilon. So in other words, if I did get a good hypothesis, good in terms of ac accuracy, I will accept. And if I didn't get it, I will reject. But good and bad are sort of close to, to optimal and far from the optimal. Where optimal is the best hypothesis, the, the, the best hypothesis in the class in the terms of its, in the sense of how it matches the, the label distribution. Okay, so let's, let's dig into this a little bit more. This is the minimal requirement for checking, for catching, uh, for requiring accuracy. In, so how do we achieve this? So for example, um, suppose the prover collects a lot of high quality data, trains a good model and gives it to the verifier. And then the verifier gets a random sample, checks to see whether on his random sample, this model predicts accurately because it's, it's labeled. And let's say it has 80% accuracy. Should he accept it or shouldn't he accept it? According to the definition I just gave. Well, the truth is that the answer to this depends on whether um, this class of hypothesis is what we call is in the realizable case. And that is that really your ground truth F can be expressed as an hypothesis in this class. So again, if we're talking about um, a decision tree model where you every point is, is something true or not true, and you keep going and make to accept or reject, uh, suppose your function f can be expressed as a decision tree. In that case, it means that there is an hypothesis in your class whose loss is zero. There is a way, there is a decision tree which would be perfect, okay? So there is an H which would be perfect. In that case, in fact, all the verifier has to do is to take enough random samples, one over epsilon say will be enough. And uh, expect, he expects that what he got will always be uh, correct, right? It all, because there is uh, an H which with error zero. And uh, if it's zero, he always accepts. And if it's bigger than, um, than epsilon, then he rejects. So it's very easy to show that then you could sort of verify with order one over epsilon samples, whereas learning we know requires something called D over epsilon, where D is the a measure of complexity of the hypothesis class, which is called um, a VC dimension. Okay, so all this meant to say was that there's an, e there's an easy case. And that is if in fact, there is an hypothesis in the class that you were, that the learner was producing hypothesis, which actually matches the truth perfectly, then all you need to do is kind of sample, take your random samples, check how accurate they are, and they should be essentially all but epsilon accurate. So there could be an error epsilon, and then you accept. The interesting case is what we call the agnostic case. And that is probably most of the cases. And that is, listen, there is no hypothesis that's perfect. All hypotheses are gonna suffer a loss with respect to the real truth, F. So we still want to achieve completeness and soundness. And that means that, you know, yes, it's easy to estimate how well my, my hypothesis H does in terms of loss with respect to the distribution. Because I just take samples and I check to see whether it labels them correctly or not, this little H. But it's hard to know what would have been the optimal hypothesis. And what I'd like to verify is not what the optimal hypothesis losses, but that my the loss of little h that I received is less than optimal plus epsilon. So the whole uh, effort is to have a way for the prover to prove to the verifier that indeed his hypothesis is pretty good, that is very close to optimal. And that's the challenge. And um, essentially, what can we show? So first of all, we show the real question is, can you verify requiring a lot less samples than learning? Because there's a lot of work in the learning literature on how many samples are needed in order to pack learn. And the question is, how about verification? Is that an easier job? 
inherently, or maybe it's as hard a job, in which case the whole thing is very uninteresting. So it turns out there are hypothesis classes where you cannot do better ver to verify than to learn, but sometimes you can. So significantly better meaning you need um, a omega of D samples, so roughly D samples, at least these samples. D again is this measure of complexity of the hypothesis class, whereas verifying a square root of that. And more interesting maybe is the fact that you can get some qualitative separation. So one can show that for a very rich class of functions, F, uh, which are essentially have only T, um, so let's think of this, maybe have only one uh, non-zero coefficient in the Fourier basis, uh, or some very few constant number of non-zero coefficient in the Fourier basis of the function. And this is something that's been learned, uh, worked on in learning theory. So decision trees, for example, can be expressed as these type of uh, functions with few uh, non-zero uh, Fourier coefficients. Then one can show that even though to learn such functions, okay, so to learn an hypothesis for the learner requires membership queries. So you can't just take random samples. You have to give an X and get back F of X for X's of your choice. As a verifier, it's enough to take random samples of X, F of X, and that will be enough in order to be able to verify both achieving completeness and soundness that the um, model you received, this sparse rep a, a, a representation or the decision tree in the case we, that we are using this description to describe decision trees uh, is close to optimal. And another thing that's interesting about this result is that it actually uses non-trivial two-way interaction. So the prover and verifier, it's gonna be important for the verifier to ask his questions from the prover in such a way where he hides in some sense. He, he asks the question in a way where the prover doesn't really know how much the verifier knows about it. So the verifier is going to choose a, a bunch of random samples, X and F of X from the distribution, and then he's also going to choose some X's for which he doesn't know the answer f of X. He's going to sort of mix them together, ship it over to the prover. The prover is going to tell him how the model H classifies them. And the verifier will have some control to be able to tell whether the prover is telling him the truth or not. And this is going to enable him to check the soundness of the prover procedure. So this is probably a lot more than can come across in, for, for, for general audience. Um, but I think the important thing to remember is that there's no reason that we should believe a machine learning algorithm. We should have a definition of how to verify it, and this is one particular such definition. And there are some non-trivial things you can do in order to verify, some of which have to do with essentially querying the hypothesis or, or asking the learner to answer questions uh, in such a way that you would be able to find out if they have taken shortcuts if they have designed an hypothesis which is not sound uh, in the sense that it's far from optimal. Now, I'm not going to talk about it in this uh, lecture, but I just wanted to say that those of you who have had some encounters with machine learning algorithm more than just listening to it in the news or seeing some generalist talk, realize that there's a lot of things you can hide in it. So you can design an algorithm that looks like it matches a distribution, but it could be doing some other things as well. So there might be some subset of decisions that he makes that are not what should be. And these are the type of things that you'd like to make sure are, that don't happen too frequently. And this definition, for example, would check that. It does, you, you can't shift you know, in a radical way um, from the true distribution that you were trained on. Okay, so this is part one. Any questions here? And if not, I'm gonna keep going. Keep going? Okay. So what I want to say is, and somebody should tell me what the time is because I don't have a clock. Oh, uh, do I? Wait. I do. Okay. Uh, what I want to say is this whole, I described all this in the context of bail so that we have some example to, 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 to think about. And um, I, uh, you know, an interesting question, which is not really in the scope of this talk is, is, um, are they, even if we do come up with this definition that we feel good about, are they really gonna accept this in a courtroom? Uh, statistical evidence in a courtroom is a very interesting kind of thorny question. And uh, can judges, uh, should judges use statistics and probabilities in legal settings? Obviously they do when they talk about DNA matching. In fact, even before that, there's all these cases of going back you know, to the 1800s 
where uh, cases of forgery, you know, decided. Uh, child um, death or things like that, where they say, well, the chance that this event would have happened is very small. But often they don't, they use it without understanding product rule for probabilities. So, so they say the event A is one in a thousand, event B is one in a thousand, event C is one in a thousand. What about, then they say, well, the probability, all of these things happening is one in, you know, a thousand cubed. But often these events are not independent. So it's not very clear how in a courtroom statistics and probability will be viewed. So there's a big um, disconnect, you know, from the mathematics and from the use in reality, which is an interesting thing to study for lawyers, maybe in conjunction with mathematicians. And another question is that I didn't talk about is in the case of bail, for example, is are the verifiers allowed open source access to the hypothesis? And again, this is kind of a question that has to do with capitalism rather than anything else. Because in the California case, it was very clear that the companies developing the machine learning algorithms were going to have the right to hide the code. So how do you check the code when it's hidden? And again, you can use cryptography for it. You can, in principle at least, encrypt the, the hypothesis. And then every time you run our algorithm on it, for example, for verifying, you want to be able to check that this hypothesis on X will give back Y. And you can use things like zero knowledge interactive proofs for that. Uh, but that's more machinery on top of the basic. Okay, I want to move on to robustness. Okay, so robustness. Uh, recall this definition of valiant with the pack learning. We were given a bunch of X's from the distribution. We we're given a bunch of labels, F, and we were supposed to learn H. Okay. Um, there were two distributions actually here. One was the, the, learn, the training distribution and another one is how well my H, H does on future Xs. And when Valen defined it, the training distribution and the distribution you're gonna actually use it in the future on were the same. So it's the same P here as P here. Now, is that really true? So is it really true that usually what you train on is what you're gonna be using it on? And the answer is no. So for example, in COVID age, uh, apparently they were looking at lung, um, at pictures of lungs to determine lung cancer. And uh, they were saying that uh, before, if you look at no COVID versus uh, COVID, lung, lung scans look different, okay? So if you were trained on one, and now you see an, a new distribution, um, should you use the old program? Should you redo it? Another thing is like, you know, in the US, when you uh, trained to distinguish uh, handwriting letters. So this is how you write one on US, this is how you write one international. These are natural dis difference in distributions, okay? So a program that was trained on US data doesn't necessarily work on international. Now uh, we call this covariate shifts. Um, this is the easy case. The harder case is it could be that in fact, whoever is using the machine learning algorithm is an adversary. And they even may manipulate the input to, tr to trick the algorithm. So this is called adversarial machine learning. Often people worry about it in the context of self-driving cars. When they're saying, let's say the self-driving car was trained on stop signs and yield signs. And then somebody comes and they put a sticker on a stop sign or they modify the stop sign so that now it's going to look like an yield sign and God forbid there'll be an accident. So you want to train your algorithm in such a way that even when an adversarial input comes in, it doesn't it, it behaves properly. So again, there's one training distribution and then the distribution happens in the real world. Now, the current way that people deal with this is they say, well, let's define a class of domain specific perturbations. So we take, for example, in the case of cars, we take pictures and now we say, well, an adversary, what are they gonna do? They're really gonna rotate the picture. They might change some pixels. There's some natural things that an, al an adversary would do. I'm going to protect against such a class of adversaries. But when you think of as, as a cryptographer, as I do, the adversary doesn't really tell you what they're gonna do. So by definition, being an adversary is the worst case. You know, he wants to trick you. Why would he tell you his strategy? In fact, uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of papers in this where they say, well, you know, if the training uh, is panda pictures and then I put some barcodes on them, you know, it can be defined as a plane. There's all these weird kind of things that happen in machine learning algorithms. So it's very, very different than obvious transformation of a panda. Or another example that people usually talk about is in the context of YouTube. 
actually, and we're having this broadcast on YouTube. So YouTube should automatically tell whether the a video that's submitted is a it doesn't contain pornography or hate speech or something of that sort. And uh, they have they do that automatically. But obviously, whoever wants to get their YouTube to be posted are not going to just manipulate the video in an, in a standard way, but they might do something to throw it off. So our crypto goal will be safety for any adversary. Maybe we can say that the adversary is computationally bounded, but other than that, they are allowed to do anything. And I still want my machine learning to be robust. So I, the second result is about this, and I'm going to illustrate it sort of in mathematical terms using um, as a working example, the problem of learning half spaces. So we have a plane here. There are points that are defined as pluses and points defined as minuses. And um, the machine learning model is essentially a line or a plane that separates uh, the plus from the minus, okay? So the, in during the training, you get positive examples, negative examples, okay? Then come uh, your machine learning learns and let's say it decides on H. H is the straight line, F was the truth, which was a little bit diagonal. Now test time, you get plus, you get th these black dots, black dots here, black dots here. These are gonna be pluses, these are gonna be minuses, everybody's happy. There'll be very few mistakes. But what happens if the test distribution, the little dots, the black dots are different than the training? What happens if they all fall in here? So rather than there's some that fall in the pluses, some that fall around the minuses and some fall where I, I saw no examples whatsoever. In other words, the training distribution, which are the greens and the blues, are different from the test distribution, which are these little black dots. Now, this means that maybe F was this line or maybe F was that line. From the data that I've seen, it's equally likely. This tells me that it's essentially impossible to get the right answer about these dots over here. It's an impossible task. So when the training distribution and the test distribution are really radically different, there's nothing we can do. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna change our requirement. Since it's impossible to classify this correctly, what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna allow my hypothesis essentially to have three options. It could say plus, minus, or abstain. Okay, I'm gonna allow it to say, you know what? I have no idea. In fact, it will turn out that that's not good enough either. Because when, the ad when it's really an adversarial person who's giving you the the, the, the dots in the test time, you may think that this adversary, he may even even know which, uh, what's your current hypothesis. He knows your hypothesis is this, okay? And he might even know what the truth is. All he wants to do is to trick you. So they can, he can put all of his examples right next to something where your hypothesis makes the mistake. So we're gonna make one more change. First change was, we're only gonna require you to say yes, no or abstain. So we allow you the freedom to abstain. And the second thing is that we're gonna say, you know what, in addition to getting the usual plus minus training, I need some access to the points in the distribution of test time, unlabeled ones. But I need to know, I need some access to points that are going to be asked, that come from the distribution that of the, the, dot, the test distribution. Okay, so I've made huge departures from what the, the usual pack learning was, which was I was given training and I was expected to do well on that training distribution. I'm saying, you know what? If I am expected to do well in situation where it's impossible to do well, I need you to give me more. First, you should give me the freedom to say, I don't know. Second, I want you to give me some samples of the test distribution. Don't tell me if they're plus or minuses. Just give me some samples. And what can I, what am I, um, required so we have, uh, to, to achieve. So the definition, uh, we call it PQ learning rather than just PAC learning. This is the paper with uh, Adam Kalai, Yael Kalai, and Omar Montessari. Um, and we call it beyond perturbations, learning guarantees with arbitrary adversarial test examples. The idea now is this, I will be given just like before the X and the F of X in the training distribution. But in addition to that, I will be given some XI primes, these red ones for the training, uh, sorry, this should be the, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, I have to uh, <laughs> correct that in real time. Otherwise it's too confusing. Mm. Uh, here we are. Uh, here we are. 
in the test distribution. Right, so I'm given the one distribution P is the training, and then I'm given some sample of what the test questions are going to be without the answers. And my goal is to output an H as before, but also to output essentially the domain of, it, of H. So I'm going to say, I'm going to give you the correct answer as long as the X fall in the set S. So if you look at this picture here, I will give you the right answer. I give you a pluses. Uh, I don't know about the right answers, but I'll give you a plus or minus as long as they're in this ball here, plus and minus. But if you are out of the set S, I'm, I'm going to abstain. And what I will guarantee is that the rate abstain here is the rate of abstaining with respect to the training distribution, plus the loss with respect to the testing distribution, their sum is going to be less than epsilon. So in other words, the intuition is this. I want to make sure that I don't make mistakes. Okay. So of course, I want the loss to be small. However, I know that that's impossible if I haven't seen the distribution. So I'm saying, you know what, in that case, I can abstain, but I certainly don't want to be allow you to just say abstain all the time. So you can't abstain always. So with respect to the training distribution, this requires the training that the abstaining is small. So this combination ensures that you don't abstain all the time and that when you do have a chance to give the right answer, you will. Now you could ask if it's reasonable to assume that you have access to these examples. And I think that in many settings it is, I don't want to convince you, but in many settings you can even fix in hindsight or like in the, um, uh, there are actually cases where all you care about is that not to make big mistakes, like in a medical domain. If you're in the middle question. of a medical procedure, yeah? Question. Yeah, so, but how is it, isn't this sort of the same as knowing the strategy of the adversary that you initially convinced us that it wasn't a good idea to think about? So um, I don't know the strategy. I don't, it's not like they took, a, um, this, when I said strategy before, I meant you have, uh, let's say, a, examples from a distribution and then a set of transformation on them. So that's what they usually done. Here I'm saying do it for any distribution. So, it's, so there it's restricted to uh, classes of perturbations. Here I'm saying, give me any distribution, but give me examples from the distribution. So I don't know how you obtain them and I'm not restricting how you obtain them. Mm. I'm, give me, a, and in fact, there are two result, two sets of cases. One is, and I'll, I'll show you the results in a minute, but uh, but I'm saying give, for any Q, could be a very extremely crazy Q, uh, I will give you this guarantee. And anyway, you make a good, que your question is, maybe you can show that, um, a, that you could obtain this from a perturbation, this equivalent to some sort of perturbation definition, but I don't see it. Okay. If they showed, if they would have shown that for any perturbation, then it would be the same. But they showed for okay. particular classes of the perturbation. Okay. So what kind of results can you get here? Um, so the first result is really in this domain where there's two distribution, P and Q. And what we say is that for every Q, uh, so if you can learn in PAC, you know, where, where the training and the testing were the same distribution, then you can learn in this model for every Q. Uh, with this uh, guarantee. So the abstain plus the loss is essentially order of square root of D over N, where in the pack, it would have been D over N without the square root. So you, you lose here. So rather than epsilon, you have in some sense a square root of what you could have done before. Um, so that's the one result. Um, I could give a, a, a sense of how, but I just want to state what the other result is first. And that is, what about the case where it's an adversary rather than just two distributions, P and Q? So how is that different? In this case, the model is like this. Again, you're given these X and F of Xs in the original testing uh, training distribution. And then first the learner outputs an H and then there's an all knowing adversary. He knows the H that was output. He knows the ground truth even. And now he outputs a bunch of test examples. Okay, now it's not a distribution, it's specific test examples. And I, what, I, what I want now is um, the learner to go through a next phase uh, where he knows these Ts, right? And that where he says, okay, I'm gonna output now a set on which I can restrict my H um, where uh, if my, the X is not, or the, these Ts are not in S, I will uh, abstain. Otherwise I will give the measure of accuracy that I claimed. And the measure of accuracy is again, the same. So, but here it's, um, I, I'm 
I'm talking abstaining with respect to these specific T1 through Tn. So whereas before the statement was distributional, here the statement is really with respect to an adversary who can sort of design his test examples as, you know, in sort of worst possible uh, way. Now this theorem is, the premise is a bit different. So essentially you need a stronger learning algorithm, a standard learning algorithm in order to achieve it. What will be the, the, the strategy? I didn't have a slide on this because I didn't think we have time for it. Um, but the strategy essentially to do this, maybe I do have a slide, is the following. Do I? Yeah. Uh, the strategy to do this, which is really beyond what we want to do in a talk of this form, but is the, is the idea is the following. Is the learner will first uh, compute a classifier um, using standard machine learning. And now, um, a, it's going to sort of take the test, uh, the examples that he got from the test distribution, okay, from the Q, not P, and he's going to form sort of, a, a, um, he's going to um, essentially try to learn another classifier, which agrees with the, uh, with the previous one on, um, on the training data, but disagrees the most on the test data. So, and this disagreeing the most is going to allow you to define the region where you abstain. And you do this in an iterative fashion. Um, and the trick here is essentially to define a new distribution. So take the training example, which are labeled and give them a lot of weight, and then take the test examples, which are not labeled, give them sort of fake labels, okay, which are sort of conjectured labels. Uh, and the labels there are sort of essentially going to be um, exactly the opposite of what your classifier does. Um, and you do this in an iterative fashion. In any case, um, there are, it's not the only strategy to, to uh, in fact, there's another follow-up paper where they, instead of allowing plus, minus, and abstain, you know, for this example of half plane, they have a, a cost. So they have penalty for abstaining. And then they essentially try to minimize the objective function, which minimizes this penalty. And uh, by doing that, they come up with a different type of algorithm that enables, um, you know, a, to minimize uh, a, their objective function, minimize the penalty, but it has essentially morally the same uh, outcome where you either classify or you say, I abstain, and you try to incur l as little cost as possible. Um, so what is this essentially uh, conclusion of this? is that you can take any binary classification algorithm. You start from a learning algorithm that already exists uh, and you use it in order to identify and reject suspicions pattern in unlabeled test data. So you sort of take whatever algorithm you have, you take the test data that arrives, and now instead of just running the algorithm on it, you run what we are proposing and that will sort of signal out to you what's suspicious, okay? Um, this helps to reduce error uh, in places where error has high cost, like a medical type setting or maybe a setting where you, know, you really do not wanna make uh, mistakes. Of course, the problem is that not making mistakes is not good enough, right? So there's a lot of settings where we gotta make a decision. We can't just say, well, you know what? We don't have the data. We just are not gonna make a mistake. And in sense, some sense, it's like saying, okay, uh, letters, scans, it's okay to say, look, take another look. Don't let the automatic algorithm make decision. But Oh, I don't know what happened here, but you know, there's a lot of um, debate now that, for example, that the algorithms don't have enough good data, so they make the good decisions on data. For example, you know, in recognizing faces, they make good decisions for faces they see often, and they don't recognize people with darker shades or something like that. So that's not. So we are saying our algorithm will just say, "Hey, you have a darker shade. I cannot commit to recognize you." Obviously, that's not good enough. So we should not be used to not collect more data. Uh, in fact, this other work that I won't have time to is how do you make valid statistical conclusions when, uh, when you don't have sufficient access to random data? This is still unpublished. Um, there's actually a lot of work on this in statistics. Usually they have something called propensity score reweighting where you have a lot of data uh, on some source dis uh, distribution, but you're actually interested in a different target distribution where you have very little data. So you try to learn how to correlate source and target distributions so that you can make valid statistical uh, claims on the target distribution for which you don't have a lot of random data. 
and we propose a different algorithm to do so. Um, a, I don't know if I have much more time. Uh, no, I don't. I was going to talk about privacy. So all I'm going to tell you is that I was going to talk about privacy. And uh, I, I guess I just want to rush to the end to say something, not rush, but I want to get to the end. And I want to say that this safe ML or secure ML is not restricted to achieving privacy or verifiability or robustness, nor to just using cryptography, which is my expertise. And therefore, you know, it's like a, you know, uh, everything looks like a nail to a hammer, um, but it looks like this hammer can actually say some things in this area, whether it's a model or, or a technique, but there's really a lot of uh, interesting questions there. Uh, where there's sort of a legal doctrine, there's a societal value, and then there's a math formulation. And the challenge for us, I think, as mathematicians is to come up with a math formulation which satisfies, you know, both societal values and legal doctrines. So, for example, compliance uh, is, um, a, a, is uh, something in the context of uh, medicine, right? Um, so if I look at the legal doctrines, there's right to privacy, there's anti-discrimination, there's negligence, duty of care, copyright, all these things, how do you formulate that mathematical, even as a definition, and then how do you achieve it? And then societally, they, you know, you could talk about safety, about fairness, about freedom of speech. So I think it's a fascinating area, actually, that requires, um, it requires mathematics, it requ but it does require actually talking to people from these other disciplines. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's the worst part of I invite Zoom everybody talks. to open don't the microphone people, and just thank you. Don't, yeah, so. don't have people clap. <laughs> okay. yeah. Right, Shafi. So thank you very much for this very exciting talk. Uh, so let's see. Um, uh, so there are a few questions uh, from the audience uh, from the YouTube. Uh, actually, so, um, right, so. Let me last with the, start with the last question. So Carl asks about uh, the topology of the data. So why not consider the topology of data when using, when training the model? So first of all, maybe they do use, I think they do use topology of data uh, in different, in some settings. So the way I described the data was very kind of boring data, you know, specific numerics, uh, numerical categorical variables, you know, male, female, young, old, uh, and so forth. But I think that there are, especially now in this, uh, this work on finding new proteins, you know, there was some work with uh, Nagina Barzilai and some people in MIT, specifically that I'm aware of, where they have some topological information about how the a protein is, is it looks like, and uh, they use that as a way to represent data input to the machine learning algorithm. But it's not part of what I was using here because I wasn't talking about how to learn, I was talking how to verify. Uh, would there be some questions from the Zoom audience? So I would invite you to open the microphone and ask the question yourself. Anybody? I think I have a good question for Shafi. Thanks, Shafi, for this nice, very nice talk. So I have a question about the first part on this model of uh, verifying machine learning. Uh, so the question is about the samples given uh, to the uh, verifier. Are these samples public or they are private to the verifier? Thank you. So in everything, right. So in everything that I uh, discussed today, was everything was public. But the, uh, usually, for, so, so it was really talking about definition for accuracy. If you wanted to add privacy, you could, because in these algorithms, everything that was, uh, we were using the hypothesis as a black box. So I just would have to check. So if I, if I received a sample, which was encryption of X and encryption of F of X, okay? And then I access the box uh, and I was able to access the box in an encrypted manner, I could still, these are the type of statements I could still check without looking at the guts of the algorithm. But I didn't do that. But this is sort of a layer on top that could be added. And uh, in your qualitative uh, example, using uh, uh, Fourier uh, sparsity, uh, how much interaction is needed? Is it like uh, constantly many rounds of interaction? Or can, can you say something? It's just two rounds, like one, two. So it's actually an interesting question to show that you would need sort of uh, you know, if there, you could separate, let's say, k from k plus one, that you really need more than more than two, yeah. And to be honest, um, 
The reason we use that as a first example is because there is some resulting cryptography that could be repurposed for this purpose. It's, um, but we have some work on um, half planes and uh, and uh, on linear regression also where uh, you're trying to prove the, that your regression model is, is accurate. And, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? I have a question, Yoshi. Hi, Sahi. Hi, I'm Yoshi Garcia from Campinas, yeah. and um, I'm a statistician. So I'm yeah. very yeah. suspicious about machine learning in some sense, yeah. that uh, we like models, we like uh, things that can be hypothesis testing and things like this. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I would like you to, to talk about a little bit more about uh, this verifiability that can you go back to the to one slide that you say um, verifier acceptors and the laws is law less than something yes, I yes, do yes. not remember which I one is I think that's the definition slide yeah uh, I think so. well I agree with you by the way that's why <laughs> uh, one needs a definition whether this is the correct one or not in the sense of whether you like yeah, it yeah yeah. Okay. This is what I, uh, the, the hypothesis, the completeness. You well, say that I, the problem... This should be, by the way, a little age, sorry. I mean... Okay. Yeah, my question is, this completeness and soundness, is yes. this the intersection of it? It's not given, like, the probability that the verifiers accept, given that the loss is small, is... No, it's in the end. It's in the, it's in the end. So I, I want to say um, a... A, okay, so you're, you're asking, um, there exists a prover, so, so you could write this like this, if the loss is small, then the probability the verify accepts is greater than one minus delta. Yeah. And over here, if the loss is large, the probability the verify accepts against any prover strategy is, is small. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, so any more questions? So it's still accurate, so but, the way, a... but the way I said it is much better to, to think of it that way. Yeah. So there's one more question uh, from Carl, uh, uh, who asks you, uh, can you talk a little bit more about your propensity score work for fairness? Right, so the propensity score is not for fairness, it's, it's from fairness. So essentially, um, this work, where is the slide? Right here. So this is work with um, Michael Kim and Christoph Kurtz and uh, Frau uh, Frauka Kotel and Omer Reingold. Uh, so essentially, what we uh, what we get here is the following: We want to make um, uh, we want to say that we have some source data, okay? And uh, let's say it's, it's, so it's labeled source data. And uh, from that, I'm go we're going to uh, build a machine learning model, okay? And there is a, a body of work on multi-calibration in the fairness literature, where they say, suppose now uh, that you want to check that this algorithm, even if you look at uh, minority groups, and the way that they, they, they call it multi-calibration is because they want to get a, they want to uh, change the algorithm so that it will um, achieve what they called calibration, uh, which means I think uh, that um, which means that um, the false positive and the false negative uh, uh, within a group is are, are done correctly rather than on the entire population, and they want to do it uh, not on just spe specified groups in advance. So 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 usually when you talk about my, uh, fairness to minority, you know which minority group you're talking. About. So it could be, you know, people who are poor or people who are from one ethnic uh, group or another. But the, the multi-calibration work essentially says that the way they're going to define a group is through um, a computational model. So they're going to say if a group is recognized by, um, I don't know, uh, a small, a low degree circuit, some small SIP computational model uh, that, will, that when you give it the input, it says, are you in the group or not in the group? And they want to say that for all groups that are captured by this model, it will be fair. Fair meaning, let's say that the false positive, false negatives are, 
are, are the same, are, are accurate. So, so, so in other words, there is some measures, let's say of fairness, okay? And you want to achieve it, uh, not just with respect to the entire population, but also with respect to uh, small subgroups. And they have a method uh, using these multi-calibration algorithms, how to take a machine learning algorithm and make it fair. And what we say is that you can use the same method, okay, essentially to make a statistical conclusion to these groups without knowing what those groups were beforehand, because they essentially it's you're not addressing a specific group, you're doing it for all groups that obey a certain different, you know, computational structure. Um, so we essentially do an adaptation from these algorithms to, um, to, to, to statistics questions like coming up with the average or whatever it is that statistic you are interested in. I'm, I'm happy to send uh, the paper, it hasn't been published yet, but if somebody's really interested in it, I'm, I'm happy to send the manuscript. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so maybe Carl can write to me, uh, and then uh, if Shafi sends it to me, I can send it to Carl, who yes. asked uh, this question. Yes. Uh, so Carl, so if you could send me some email or something. Okay, very good. Um, so let me let me close by asking just one kind of a very general question. So, uh, um, so theory of computing started many decades ago and it has evolved in lots of different directions and uh, the, as in any other subject kind of the focus may kind of shifts with time right and uh, so how do you see that in your research and in kind of what you see is happening in theoretical computer science uh, right now um it's a good question So, you know, there's several trends, right? On one hand, there are uh, fields that are well-established, even let's say complexity theory, which is one of the most traditional fields. And surprisingly, it has a lot of young blood coming into it. So uh, the questions, the big questions still remain, you know, the P versus NP or randomized polynomial time versus polynomial time. And yet there's more, um, a special cases of them. So if you think about circuits, let's look at bounded, uh, you know, algebraic circuits with some, some restrictions on the model. And people are studying these in much more detail. So I think that on, on one hand, the field is just getting older, but in a good way. Uh, that is that the, there's still interesting questions, but there's a lot more uh, talent that goes into it. There's generational components. So there's not just one, you know, few five people are working on it, but there's, there's students and there's students students. So this is one trend. Another trend that there is um, a lot of subfields that have come out of applications. So machine learning, so it's not an application, but it's a trend, right? But there are clear theoretical questions there. Well, what's the model? Why is it the right model? Can you generalize? Um, a, you know, can you make any kind of statistical guarantees like Nancy asked? Or can you say anything theoretical? Um, a, how do you deal with errors when you have, uh, let's say, not just, you have a model of the error distribution or distributed computing is another example where for many time, for many years, all they were working is on consensus, as far as I could tell, you know, I'm not a distributed computing person, but now, you know, they have the cryptocurrencies, right? So they're talking all about blockchains and how to use old algorithms for consensus to support this infrastructure that supposedly is going to be the new currency of the world. And that's obviously application driven. So I think that there's, um, on one hand, what happens the fact of field after a few decades that it becomes richer and it uses more difficult mathematics and more talent. And on the other hand, you know, computer science theory derives a lot of its problems from what's happening in practice. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. It's not it's, it, as long as one keeps an eye on uh, the ball in some sense, saying that we want to get formal guarantees, we want to get formal definitions, that you know, efficiency in some sense is a secondary becomes next, doesn't come first. Um, yeah. And, how, and what, 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 what would you say the distribution is between uh, applications and kind of uh, no applications at, at the no, Simons Institute? Uh, at the Simons Institute. Oh, it's too bad. I should have had shown some slides about that. So the Simons Institute is a theoretical institute, right? So clearly it's much more theory, basic theory driven. It is basic theory driven. 
but um, you know, theoretical computer science is funny that way. It's had a lot of uh, impact on application. If you think about when I started at MIT many, many years ago, almost 40 years ago, they were like the systems groups and the theory group, right? And the theorists were like, ah. But the fact is that if you look at search or, um, you know, graph algorithm, content distribution, uh, cryptography, those are all basic, this starts from theory and it's made huge impact. In fact, even machine learning people are theoretical models, whether they, some of them they can prove things, some of them you can't, but they start as a, as a theoretical model. So I think theory is, it's kind of, in at Simon's it's obviously the, the main, th that's what it's about, but uh, a good idea in this world, you know, makes a huge impact. Great. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone. Uh, so maybe it's time to close. So maybe Thanks. I pass the word, word, word back to Carolina. So thank you very much, Shafi. Thank you very much for the invitation. Bye-bye.